Hi there, my name is Princey. Welcome to season three of Africa for Nuclear. Today, we are joined by Professor James Lakin, who will talk to us about this exciting project called Rhizotop Project. Prof, it's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here to share what we're doing with your audience and uh, hopefully tell a, a broader audience that what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. Please tell us more about the Rhizotop Project. Certainly, it's a... Um, anti-poaching, anti-trafficking project, but it's so much more than that as well. It's also a social engagement and educational project. What we're trying to do is to reduce the amount of poaching of rhino, to certainly to start off with. Um, they are under incredible pressure. The numbers of rhino have collapsed over the last 10 years by something like 75%. So there may be 11,000 white rhino left in South Africa, um, maybe three and a half thousand black rhino. These represent something like 80% of the global population of black and white rhino. So we are losing them. And they are an incredibly important species. They're an iconic species, but they have such an important impact on the environment as well. What happens is something like a white rhino will then graze down the grasses in an area. By producing that dominant species of grass, then you get other species of grasses and plants growing, which means then you get more insects coming in, you get more insects, you get more birds, small animals. And this all just multiplies up to what we have in the end is a, um, a much broader ecosystem in a particular area and that means and the research will show that grassland is actually a very good way of locking up carbon so um, as an inadvertent result of what we're trying to achieve we are also um, trying to do our bit if you like for carbon capture and you know, climate mitigation. Why do they poach them? They want the horn of a rhino. There is a belief um, in certain parts of the world that the horn has medicinal values. So um, to treat things, all manner of different ailments, and more recently there have been claims that it is can it treat them. No. Okay. When you look at the structure and the makeup of a rhino horn, you realize it's mostly made of keratin. And it's like your fingernails and you know our pharmacy companies in the world would have long ago looked at the horn I'm and the properties of the horn to see if there was any medicinal value and the conclusion is it's not this is another use is for conspicuous consumption so those are the sorts of things and then of the sort of other use is to give rhino horn as a high value gift. And one of the important things that we need to try and persuade people in the local communities around an area is that actually to them, this animal is worth a lot more standing up because it's, it represents jobs, it represents income. Um, you know, a poached animal, you get one payout, but if you have, you know, these animals in a game reserve or something like that, then, you know, there are decent jobs for people to have. And um, when we look at the you know, catastrophic unemployment numbers in this country. Okay, so now I'm, I'm more interested to find out then how does this rhizotope, okay, how, the protection of the how do we, do we work? Okay. Yeah, how does it work? This is, okay, this is the nuclear side of it, is that we've looked at, and I'll, we've started a research process to insert um, small quantities of radioactive material into the horn of these animals. Okay, and this is for two specific reasons. One, we are wanting to push back on the end user. Now, if I were to say to you, 
here's a present, but it might be radioactive. How do you feel about it? But the other part of the plan is by making it radioactive, it's far more traceable. Because internationally, and this comes from my work in the nuclear security field, um, there are between 10 or 11,000 installed radiation monitors around the world at harbors, at airports, at border crossings. Mm -hmm. Also, there are customs agents, border, custom, border agents, people like that, who are trained and carry portable radiation monitors. So we've actually put into place where we're using what's been put into place already to intercept these horns, which are you know, smuggled out through different routes. So we are using nuclear science, so that, you know, radiation detectors, nuclear science, and radioactive materials to put these shipments, these illegal shipments at risk. And so the idea is to try and be able to change the perception of those people who handle it. So it's the middlemen, the smugglers. Mm -hmm. So we not we start to get them with, if you like, the, the, the illicit wildlife trafficking type but we're also now putting pressure onto these smuggling routes by making it almost a terrorist offence to be able to start moving this stuff. So those are where the sort of nuclear side comes into it, my background in radiation protection. So. Now, uh, tell me, Professor, and has there any be a rhino that has been posted since the inception of the we, project? Well, we, have, we haven't got to the point yet where we're putting the radioisotopes in. We're still doing the research because um, I need to be able to look, you know, into the eyes of an owner or that, and be able to say, "Hey, <laughs> what, I'm, put the what I'm doing now <laughs> is safe for your animal, but will protect your animal." And I can say that because I've done my homework. But it's not just me; it's actually an international team now. Yeah. We went from this idea on a piece of paper to me talking to a few colleagues internationally. So it's not just myself, but it's the engineers and it's the metallurgists. So your vision of the project now, do you see it expanding in, you know, uh, across the continent? Oh, yes. That's always been in the back of our heads is if we get it right here, we will make it available to anybody who wants to do it with a rhino population but we are also starting to think about can we do this with, with elephant elephant ivory and then i had some discussions recently we maybe look at things like cycad plants you see these are items again which have a high value because of their rarity and are smuggled i suppose one of the things to the non-nuclear person is, is you can think of these isotopes as a tracking device that doesn't run out will run you know it has a much longer battery life and there are systems set up in the place globally to specifically detect this stuff prof thank you for joining us here today and sharing information about the Top project we will definitely um, watch the developments as they progress further believe it or not it's the people like you who are part of the army to make this thing happen it's those people who, the, the journalists, those people who are taking an interest in what we're doing and sharing it with a broader audience makes what we are trying to do that, that bit easier. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Until next time, Salang Sintle.